Welcome. I'm Lucy Arnaz. What you're about to see is a family history. My family history. I started working on it a few years ago after my parents died and my brother Desi and I were left with the task of deciding what to do with everything that they left behind. We decided that we could edit parts of it into the most beautiful multimedia scrapbook and we could not only share it with the rest of our family but with the rest of the world at the same time. The fun part for me started once that we had digitized all of the materials and identified all the pieces of the puzzle. We then could start piecing the stories of my parents' lives together again because it led us on so many fascinating journeys and uncovered more than a few surprises. As we followed leads back into time, we made some pretty amazing discoveries, not the least of which was a forgotten manuscript that turned out to be my mother's never published autobiography. Then we found all the audio tapes that she used when she was writing it. We could now hear her life story in her own voice for the very first time. So that's the only message here. Save your family history. The pictures, the objects, the stories. If this CD scrapbook can inspire you and your family to do just that, I'll consider it a success. I've even created a companion CD-ROM called How to Save Your Family History to help you get started. In any case, we're really happy that you've chosen to visit and spend some quality time with our family. We really enjoyed every single minute of making this, so we hope that you enjoy Lucy and Desi, The Scrapbooks, Volume 1, Made for Each Other. As for me, I'm history. <laughs> I know very little of my grandfather uh, on my father's side. The only thing I knew about the ball side of the family was uh, my father's brother who was with him when he died, got sick and died in Montana and that was Clint Ball and that's about the only uh, ball part of the Ball family that uh, we uh, knew of and uh, Dee Dee for some reason or other never uh, discussed the, uh, her husband's, my father's family. I, I can only remember uh, one thing about, what was his name, Rufus Jasper Ball, Jasper, that he had a child at the age of 80, so I'm told, uh, and uh, he was married several times. My father and Lucy's father, that's Frank and Henry, and their father, Jasper, and some businessmen out of Fredonia, went from this part of the country to Butte, Montana, and set up the independent telephone company. That's when they first had the telephones out there, and I'm not sure what year that was, but it's got to be in early 1900, about 1905 or 6, I would think. And Des wasn't with him at the time, as I understand it. But after he got steady work and looked good, I think she come out there with Lucille. Lucille was a little tough. I remember um, they wanted to redo her dressing room. Her dressing room was terrifying at the studio. It was like a Quonset huh? painted brown. I mean, about as uncheery. Things like that did not bother her at all. She, she paid no attention. They went in there and we did it. Oh, and when they did it, they made a terrible mistake. She thought birds were bad luck. They had put birds in the new wallpaper that went up. She walked in and she said, I want it all down. They had to redo it. When it finally was redone after 100,000 years, she made them redo it because there were birds on the, on the wallpaper. Well, it was a it was a, a very loving relationship, a very thorough understanding. There were, we never had in my young life we never had any disagreements, never that I can recall. Never had any reprimands or nothing like that. We just the only time there were any uh, any uh, uh, discussions, they were you know they were problems, there were discussions, but they weren't, uh, I, I can't remember anything like that. I remember nothing but big Sunday dinners 
with all kinds of people showing up every Sunday, big chicken dinners and strawberry shortcakes and all that, because Dee Dee loved to cook and was a good cook and did a lot of it. And uh, of course, Grandpa, Grandpa provided all of the ingredients and uh, everything from the killing the hog at the, in the fall or whenever and, uh, you know, the whole ball game. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. The beauty of the old park, which was in my mother's day, my grandmother's day, rather than in ours, it was beginning to go by the time we were kids. But we still saw Sousa's band and concert. We still saw the outdoor movies, you know, Perils of Pauline. We still got all of the fun and the excitement of the kaleidoscopic, you know, the calliopes and the Ferris wheel and the merry-go-round and fairyland for children. But we were always... Uh, led and on picnic style, you know, with the grandmother and the grandfather and the father. It was an occasion. And I left Celeron before it really deteriorated, but it was a beautiful spot. Well, the lake was 20, about 23 miles long and a mile or two wide in some areas and uh, half a mile in other areas and very deep and very cold and very wonderful for muscalunge. I remember that fish. Oh, boy. My grandfather used to even fish through the ice in the winter time. And we used to do ice skating in the wintertime on the lake. And, of course, we never went to the lake without a cake of soap in our hands in the summertime, which really is a fond memory. I used to hate it, but my grandfather never missed a chance. Of course, that's before we had the bathroom. I worked in the park, Celeron Park. I was uh, making hamburgers. And I used to holler, Look out, look out, don't step over there, step over here and have a hamburger! In high school, she was on the basketball team. I think you have a picture there where she's lying down in front. And uh, she was she was with a bunch of girls that were two or three, four years older than she was. But she was so tall, you see, and everything, and she fitted in very well and was a very good basketball player. Well, at that particular point, I couldn't tell you what my feelings were, but I know as a result of that, uh, uh, visiting my grandfather, my yeah, my grandfather in the county jail. He wasn't actually in the jail, but he was uh, uh, regimented to within a mile of the jail. Lived in a, his own, you know, a private house. But he had to be in in the in the vicinity of the jail and report, you know, like daily and so forth. I don't remember how long he was there, but I went up there to live with him. That really broke him. And of course, at that point, uh, I mean, the whole thing in Celeron just was dissipated. And uh, in the back of the show, of course, the girls uh, 19 years old, they always got their eyes open for the fellows, you know, and if they didn't, they'd be kind of weird, wouldn't they? So, of course, you see a new fellow in Jamestown, and you perk up, and you look, and say, well, I wonder who he is. He looks pretty good, you know. And so we saw, <laughs> saw this fellow standing in the back, and uh, she was never too bashful or backward, you know, so, uh, you know, it looked like a likely prospect, I suppose, to her. So uh, he managed to just to speak and pass the time and found out that he was a newspaper man from Cleveland. Eddie Murphy, his name was. And he turned out to be a very nice man. And uh, in the course of the conversation, he said he was going to New York. Well, great. She said, my, my girlfriend and I are just planning on going, you know, this week. How about a ride down? It was the tragedy that broke up uh, the whole home life and s sent everyone in different directions. And uh, it happened that um, Grandpa was in possession of a 22 rifle. And we were target practicing. And uh, this girlfriend of mine had the rifle uh, aimed at and the little Erickson boy who was sitting on the ground, the neighbor, jumped up. Just as Ruth shot the gun and the bullet lodged right in his spine. The child was paralyzed for life and in a wheelchair. Well, Grandpa was charged. And he was held responsible for allowing minors to shoot a gun. As a result of that, Grandpa lost the house and everything and every dime that uh, they had. There was a sign on the front for rent apartment. 
She said, that's where I'm going. So she went in, and we had the one apartment. So she rented it. And my father just went, ha. He just thought she was the greatest. Uh, she did everything wonderful. Uh, she was never didn't have a mean streak in her. And uh, he was sort of like her father to her, of course. And one day, she was a little bored about walking all the time. It was only three and a half blocks from the studio, straight down to Santa Monica Boulevard. And she decided, I, George, she said, let's go look for a bike. She said, I think I'd like a bicycle. So they went shopping, and they found a second-hand one for $10. And she just loved that. She used it every day. She'd open the front door and wheel it into her apartment every night and leave it there and like it was a new car. Well, it was very important to both of us to have the family back together because we, we always lamented the fact that, you know, every time we'd get together, somebody would go off in a different direction because we were always splitting up, going in different, different areas. And uh, this was the time, this was the opportunity to put it back together. And it was not, not like it was a project, it was just like it was natural, a natural thing to do. Well. I came out by Greyhound bus, <laughs> and uh, she met me at the Greyhound bus down in Los Angeles in full makeup. She was doing Dream Girl with uh, Lily Pons and Henry Fonda, and uh, she had also bought, which was in those days, a Studebaker Phaeton. A Phaeton is a four-door convertible and beige and as long as anything you ever saw. You know. And I think most of this was to absolutely wow me, to impress me. So. And there she drove up, can you imagine, downtown Los Angeles in this Studebaker Phaeton with her full makeup and her costume from the show, from the film, and uh, picked me up and took me right back to the studio to have lunch. We went in the commissary. And here I am, you know, this <laughs> fat little Greek teenager <laughs> from Buffalo, New York. And I walk into the commissary at RKO, and I mean, there at one table is Catherine Hepburn, the thing is Cary Grant, there's Rogers and Astaire. I mean, all of these stars. You got my mouth open. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a culture shock, a real culture shock. Catherine Hepburn, um, every afternoon around four, she would have tea. I mean, listen, they could be in the middle of one of the greatest drama things of all time. Greg LaCava was shooting the picture, who was a fabulous director. And she'd say, okay, fellas, let's cool it. It's tea time. And on would come the cookies. And of course, I was a cookie monster and uh, sat there stuffing my face on cookies with Ginger Rogers and Catherine Hepburn and Lucille Ball, and Eve Arden, and Andrea Leeds. I mean, how many girls at 14 years old would have an opportunity to be with such wonderful people? Uh, I really was teased in Hollywood. I grew up in Hollywood, and I loved every blessed moment of it. And one night, I look out, and there is Lucille Ball looking up at me. And I got the shakes because I've always adored this lady. I came back and I met her with those big baby blues. I said, Miss Ball, why are you here? She said, well, I'm going to do the movie. Your Nass family was so well regarded because they were number one, old. They had been around a long time. And number two, and even more importantly, they were active. They were very active people. Uh, Desi's grandfather, my great grandfather, uh, Dr. Desiderio Nass, uh, used to uh, minister to the uh, rebels. Although, he, although the Arnaz family was a Spanish family, he ministered to the rebels during the Spanish-American Wars. He became a real hero. He was a colonel, as I recall, in the Revolutionary Army, a medical colonel. He also liked to travel quite a bit and um, uh, collect animals and specimens from his trips. He traveled with Bacardi, with Emilio Bacardi, and with Teddy Roosevelt. Cuba is so beautiful that it's very hard to describe. It is a country that has mountains, and it has beaches, and it has escarpments, rocky shores, and it has color. 
very definitive color. Green prevails even along the sides of the hills, but the reds are red, the yellows are yellows. It's a beautiful country. It was good growing up in Cuba. It was good growing up in Santiago. Santiago was a uh, was an old colonial city, and often it showed it. Most of the buildings were stucco. Some of this was chipping, and you could see kind of big marks and what have you. But there was a warmth to it, and there was a lot of color to it. And the uh, houses ranged from you know pale yellows to, to pinks to oranges to whites. Uh, and it was hot. And I remember that Santiago was hot. And I always used to think of these buildings with these blistering sides. When I was a little kid, I used to think that this happened because it was so hot. I knew this is when we were children. I mean, you know, that when I was about eight years old, used to live not very far from my home, and we he used to knock at my door and used to say, the, "Marco, what's going on?" Because he used to hear my the piano. You know, this he was a very musical person, and he learned the guitar, the basic of the guitar uh, playing when he was uh, the, a teenager, actually. He started he picking up uh, the guitar and he used to sing in many affairs, you know, and uh, he used to sing the guitar uh, to the girls and serenade them and things like that. that that's the way he started. He, and he loved music. He, he, he wasn't aware of time when he was, uh, you know, the, with the guitar and singing songs, also Cuban songs. This he was the most happy person when he was singing and with his guitar. I feel that what happened uh, during this revolution was that anybody who was involved in government who had to deal with a party in power, who probably was part of the party in power or they wouldn't be in government, was tainted. You know, uh, there's a, uh, the, 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 the mango tree, if uh, in one branch, if one mango gets a disease, all the other ones taste like they have that to see, even though the skin looks good. Try it sometime. You'll see that I'm telling you the truth. And I think that, I think what happened is that the revolution produced a mango disease. And <laughs> those who, uh, who had been more than helpful and who had been very attentive uh, members of government were tainted. So the family, the city was forced to leave. It hurt the family immensely because it broke it apart. Uh, and it had been a very close family. The family, however, continued to keep in touch with each other. And after many years, you know, obviously Manuel came out of hiding and settled and had a little farm out in the country someplace and just kind of a semi-retirement place. And the rest of the Arnaz family was uh, rehabilitated, if you will, reestablished. But Desiderio elected to really stay in the United States. This is father, unfortunately was on the side of the government. The revolution brought him down. They burned Desi's home. They put his father in prison, and Desi and his mother barely escaped alive. The last thing his father said to him was, take care of your mother. We will all get back together again. Desi came here and he found himself in a whole new mode of life. Still flexible, he was willing to play and he had fun doing that. His father was willing to break tile in order to <laughs> do fireplaces and make a buck in Miami after having been very wealthy down there. All these experiences make the person. And I think that anybody learning about all these experiences and these little nuances and backgrounds, as I said, will get a better picture, a better collage of who Desi was. He came back to Havana, at the time he was living in Havana, and uh, that was in 1938. 
Desi came to my home and uh, he wants him, uh, me to help him in selecting new numbers, new music, because he was forming a small band, rumba band, in Miami Beach. So he spent a couple of days in Havana and uh, I was very happy to see him after what happened, you know, with the revolution and all this ordeal that he had to go through in Miami. I gave him a lot of new music that they were playing at the time. <coughs> at the time, the, the rumba uh, that was very popular there, the cha-cha-cha, that was very popular in, in Havana. So I gave him a lot of music, new music, you know, we went and spent about three or four hours in the music store picking up and he told me, say, I want you to be select all the, the best numbers, you know, because I, I want to form my new band, rumba band in Miami Beach. Well, Des, it was it was a different New York in those days. It was very exciting and innocent and safe. And your father, before he met your mother, was going with a very attractive lady, part of a dance team called the DeMarcos. Your father didn't miss much. <laughs> I wish I had had a chance. Anyway, uh, he was on the town every night because he was idolized. New York in those days was very innocent and uh, very exciting to be a part of. The El Morocco, the Stall Club group, and your father was the toast of the town. You know, your father was from a very fine family. Plenty of lolly. Anyway, not sugar, but lolly. Anyway, we get into rehearsals and we start learning the songs. And that's the first time... Oh, Diosa Costello. Yeah. She was also in her. Sorry, Diosa. Uh... I've always been crazy about bongos and samba, mambo, and whatever, ta, 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 ta. and it was just coming back into vogue. And when Desi did the first act finale with playing the bongos of uh, whatever it was, the song, the blew the roof off the off the theater in New York. We had a marvelous time on that picture, and George Abbott loved to rumba. He was a fabulous uh, rumba dancer, and. Of course, Desi wrote the book. I mean, he was doing babaloo and banging the drums and all that wonderful thing. And we used to go dancing at the El Sombra nightclub, which was up above a market. So we'd finish shooting, we'd all run home and get into our slacks and run down there and dance. And we had a ball, Lucy and Desi and George and myself. We came out of the Super Chief as the first time I'd ever been to California, and it was a different California than it was is today. I mean, Hollywood Boulevard was glamorous. There were lots and lots of empty lots of poinsettia plants and Christmas trees. You could see, and Rodeo Drive had a wide bridal path down the middle, and I used to ride horses with your father down there, was the and along the front of that other hotel up there. On Sunset Boulevard, you could ride it. And the no cars was empty. And uh, we started shooting at RKO. Little did we know your mother was going to own it one day, and Daddy. But it was a sweet studio. Everybody was happy. It was a, And your mother introduced me to uh, uh, Carol Lombard, whom I adored. And Citizen Kane, Orson Welles was shooting Citizen Kane. Charlie Lawton, Lupe Velez. Irene Dunn was shooting, and Joan of Paris with Michelle Morgan, and uh, the, the, every lot, every stage had some activity. We used to go dancing, the girls and I, uh, and, uh, and have dinner after the work at a Mexican place that played Cuban music and dance there. And Desi, I mean, Lucy came to me and said, well, what is this place you people all go? I said, I don't know about it. He said, I'd like to go. I said, well, wonderful, join us. He said, I'll get the... I said, I have Desi pick you up. And so Desi picked her up, and when we got there, they were at a table for two. And I sent over word, go ahead, come on and join us now. And the word came back, well, never mind, they were all seated, they'd stay there. And they stayed there for the rest of the run. <laughs> the kids would take all us HAPs coming out on the uh, uh, Super Chief. We're taking bets, including Mr. Abbott, uh, uh, that Lucille, your mother, was going to fall for me. And I said, no. And I was not that. I was dumb, kind of a Swede. 
I said, she's going to go for the dark one. She's going to go for the opposite, the Latino. And, of course, when those two met, it was like that. It was very exciting to watch. He loved the whole family thing because he, too, was an exile, you know, uh, from his country and from his roots. And here he uh, walks into a family scene. This isn't just a, an actress in Hollywood, but she has a mother and a grandfather and sisters and brothers and, and a home and uh, that he brought eventually, you know, his mother to. We went on picnics and we did all these things. Of course, she was working with him uh, at the studio at RKO. Too many girls, and yes, of course, uh, they were dating. And uh, but he was also dating Lana Turner, Betty Grable. I mean, our competition was pretty good, <laughs> and uh, uh, that was a little worrisome, I think. And then the picture was over. Now he goes back to New York, and. Uh, she found reasons to be able to have for RKO to go back to publicity. She'd do anything they wanted, as long as it was back, you know, in New York, <laughs> so that uh, she could be there. And uh, she was there, and whatever she did, I don't know, but it didn't take long. <laughs> it didn't take long to do it. And we got the call that they had eloped to Connecticut. Say, have you ever met a girl who's the toast of the town? A work of art without a question, who gives your heart a queer congestion. Say, have you ever met a dream in the red velvet gown? If you will pardon my suggestion, you better write her number down. She's the gay young girl, all the magazines feature upon my word. She's the sippiest creature, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's the Valentine's, all the movies are out.
We wanted to get a place of our own, a little ranch if possible. Our friend Jack Oakey, who lived in the valley in a house that used to belong to Barbara Stanwyck, suggested we look in Northridge. You cannot visualize exactly what five acres are until you see them enclosed in their pretty white three-rail fence with a nice big gate in front. When we saw the 200 orange trees, the little road leading to the house, and the swimming pool in back, we thought it was just perfect. We fell in love with the place immediately. A friend gave us two calves to fatten up and butcher, but they both became sick. One of them died, but the other got over the illness after Lucy and I stayed up all night long with her, holding her, wrapping her in blankets, and feeding her the medicine the vet had left. Eventually, she got to be 2,200 pounds, a black and white Holstein. She fell in love with me and would come to our bedroom window in the middle of the night and moo. Lucy would wake up and say, there's your girlfriend trying to get into the bedroom. You better go and do something before she comes right through the window. We called her the Duchess of Devonshire. 